Our next panel is going to focus on housing needs of immigrants, refugees, and large families. And the panel will address emerging needs of the growing immigrant and refugee communities in our metro area. Now the discussion will include cultural and large family housing requirements for these communities, as well as the panel addressing the changing housing needs of seniors. So first, let me introduce to you P. Ariel Burgess. She's the Vice President of Client Services at the International Institute of St. Louis. The International Institute of St. Louis has offered comprehensive adjustment services for refugees and immigrants in our community since 1919. Ms. Burgess is directly, uh, directs the agency's client services programs, including refugee resettlement, case management, employment, and senior services, social work, and counseling. P. Ariel Burgess. Also, Places for People assists survivors of torture with an array of services, including family reunification assistance, case management, psychiatry, uh, job placement. Our panelist, Ron Clutho, coordinates the refugee and immigrant program and has 20 years of experience as a refugee resettlement caseworker here in St. Louis. And finally, Julia Ostropolsky, a former refugee from the former USSR. Julia began her career working with the Russian Jewish community in St. Louis County. She soon identified a significant gap in services for the communities where English speaking was limited, especially for older members of those communities. She, along with a fellow refugee, found it, founded Bilingual International Assistant Services to establish a system of holistic care that would meet the needs of all seniors, regardless of language or origin. So we welcome all of you here today. Thank you for being here. And Ariel, we'll let you start. Thanks. The International Institute provides services to both refugees and immigrants. Um, we provide many services, but for the purpose of this meeting, I'm gonna talk specifically about providing housing to our refugee clients. Um, we are able to provide refugee resettlement through a Department of State contract, and that includes providing housing, or at least locating housing, for newly arrived um, refugees. Now, there is a distinction between refugees and immigrants. Immigrants are individuals who come to the United States uh, to join families, to find a job, uh, or, or to go to school. They are individuals that we consider to be um, pulled to the United States, whereas refugees are individuals who come to the United States because they've proven a well-founded fear of persecution based on race, religion, ethnicity, or political beliefs. They are pushed to the United States. Given a choice, they would not have come to the United States. They would have stayed in their home country. However, because of violence and tension and, and persecution, they um, applied for refugee status to the United States. So I'm going to speak specifically about housing um, newly arrived refugees. If you can see this um, uh, slide, pretty much housing around the world, this was a very quick Google search on the internet I did, um, and it represents housing in Iraq, uh, Burma, uh, and Jordan. Uh, it's housing around the world typically is what I would call compound housing. It's housing that would house multiple family members and extended family. So it's not unusual to have housing that would house 10 or more people all within one compound or one wall or maybe even one building. Um, refugees can come from uh, individual housing units, but they can also come from refugee camps. Most Africans, if you've um, had any dealings with refugees, most Africans are going to come from refugee camps. And as this slide shows, refugee camps are pretty much tents out in the desert, out in barren land, but people are all grouped together. Remember, if you fled a war or persecution, um, if you were being discriminated against because of who you believe in or, or who you pray to or your political beliefs or what you look like, whatever remaining family members are alive, you want them to be with you. So even if that means that three tents are put all together, three tents are put together so that the whole existing family can remain. Now, just a little bit of background. Um, in 2013, the International Institute resettled 
580 refugees. Now we provide many, many service to immigrants and other statuses, but I'm just talking about refugees. This year, in 2014, we expect to resettle a little bit over 600 or maybe right at 600. And the numbers that you see before you are not going to change. But the only significant change um, will be among the Congolese. Um, the Bhutanese will most probably go down. And we most probably won't have any Uzbekis or Togolese. But all of the other populations are going to um, stay the same. The Congolese is a big push with the United States government to resettle them into the United States. I would say off the top of my head, in the past three months, we have resettled close to 40 Congolese just since June. So this will be a large population. Now 580 refugees translates to about 200 plus individual housing. Um, so the Institute either working with individual family members and or individual private landlords is going around trying to find housing for these individuals and these families. Last week we had a family of 10 arrive. 10 people, two parents, eight children. Finding a house in St. Louis that's within a financial guideline for rent for 10 people is very, I'll just tell you, it's very painful. Um, and then, as I described before, those 10 people, let's say we did find um, a house for them with the appropriate number of bedrooms, I guarantee you, the next day when our caseworkers go to visit, those 10 people are all sleeping in the same room. They've moved the mattresses, if they're gonna sleep on mattresses, and they're all gonna be in the same room. Why? Because of the persecution that they fled, because they're in a strange country, they're in a strange city, nobody speaks their language. This is people that they know. This is their community, at least for the first couple of weeks. Now, the expectations of refugees is, um, in, in, in my words, very unrealistic. Unfortunately, the United States mass media precedes us and goes across the world. And I kid you not when I tell you that the majority of refugees that come to the United States through the International Institute truly believe that all Americans live like a soap opera. We all get driven to work. We all get along with our neighbors. We all go to college for free. Um, we have fantastic jobs that we can either work if we choose to or not. That idea of the roads paved with gold and the land of milk and honey really does arrive, that thought at least, with um, the refugees who come to the United States. Um, this is, is something that we frequently have to overcome. It's very hard to talk to someone and say, no, I don't get driven to work every single day in a limo or I don't get along with my neighbors. Keep in mind that they fled persecution and violence. So in order to leave their home country, they have to incorporate and believe wherever they're going is a million bazillion times better. Think about it. What would it take for you to leave the United States? And I'm not saying just go to California, and I'm not saying go to Canada or Mexico. I'm saying Saudi Arabia. Does anybody know a lot about Saudi Arabia? In my mind, Saudi Arabia is sand dunes and people covered in clothes, both men and women, and I don't know if I can even talk to the men as a woman. So I'm going to believe that everything I'm missing in the United States, the persecution, everything will not occur in Saudi Arabia. I'm going to believe that Saudi Arabia has so much money, they're gonna put me up in a palace. They're gonna get me the job that I want as a social worker, not as a floor sweeper, not, not, not as, as a gardener, as a social worker, which is what I'm trained at. That's the mentality that refugees arrive with when they come. So when they come and then they see their housing, which is decent, it's not horrible, but it's old, um, uh, they're, they're, it's freshly painted, it's sparsely furnished, and it's in a city next to people that uh, refugees don't know. It's a letdown. Even if we were to place refugees, I don't know, wherever, you know, the rich part of St. Louis is, 
it would be a letdown for refugees because it's not what was imagined in their minds. Now, in addition to just the physical building and what it looks like and the expectations of, of new clients, we also have other barriers that we work with with refugees. And one of them I've touched on a little bit, and that's the occupancy rules. <laughs> Our clients have no concept that you can't put 10 people in one room. Absolutely none. Now, at the Institute, um, our housing manor manager, Booker Gilliam, who, who might be here today, I think. Um, Booker, are you here? He's going to hate me for calling him out. Um, I'm sorry? There he is. <laughs> Booker. Booker is responsible for finding all of the housing for new refugees. So he goes out to the community, he goes out to the landlords, he negotiates rates and rents because believe it or not, the United States government gives each refugee $925 for three months. That's it. That 925 has to pay rent, has to turn on utilities, has to furnish the apartment, has to provide food. You can see that 925, one time only, goes very, very quickly. So Booker is out there negotiating with rents, uh, landlords for lower rents, um, asking that for lower de uh, security deposits or none, and he is abiding by the occupancy rules. Once clients move out of their initial apartment that we found for them, they may or may not abide by the occupancy rules. Um, they may or may not tell a landlord, yes, I'm a family of 10. They might just say, my wife and I are looking for an apartment, and the next thing you know, you've got 10 people in a two-bedroom apartment. So occupancy rules are something that we go over with our clients multiple times, but whether it ever sinks in or they ever comprehend it, it most probably takes a year or maybe longer to fully understand occupancy rules. Maintenance and upkeep is another issue that we work with our clients on a, a lot. Think about it. If you came from a resettlement camp, your mentality is what we call a refugee mentality. Um, you, it is not uncommon to go into um, a Somali household and see four or five TVs stuck underneath the table. And I, I've had this situation and I've asked, what are they, all those TVs for? Well, it's in case they have to barter for something else in the future. In a resettlement camp, you stored every little extra thing you could, whether that was a piece of cloth or an extra piece of bread, because you never know. Tomorrow, you might need to barter that for a for, for, for vaccine for your child's life. So it's not uncommon to have this um, mentality of, I don't want to say hoarding, but keeping things. One of my favorite stories is I went to visit uh, a Muslim family, and they had a Bible. And, and this just intrigued me to, to no end. I asked my interpreter, and the interpreter said, oh, no, they don't know what that is. They just know it might be something that they can trade at a book fair. <laughs> OK, so we, we talk a lot about maintenance and upkeep. We do a lot of housing orientation. We, we go in with the clients when we pick them up from the airport and the very next day. And no matter how many times we tell them the toilet does not include a spatula, you don't put a spatula in it, you've got to live it. They've got to see it firsthand. You can sometimes say this till you blue in the face, but you've got to point out the examples. This is how a microwave works. This is how a shower turns on and off. Our caseworkers are always very involved with the housing and the clients and the landlords. The benefit of renting with the Institute is the landlords have somebody to call when there is a spatula in the toilet, and we can go over that with them. I've kind of given you just a, a glimpse into refugee resettlement as it relates to housing um, in particular. I'm going to turn it over to Ron, who's going to talk to you a little bit about working with the community who's been here a little bit longer, say after three months. Ron? Thanks. Can you hear me? Is that okay? I don't, I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm sorry. Um, I work with Places for People. Um, we're a mental health agency, but my particular team in the agency works specifically with refugees who are survivors of torture. And we're in a collaborative relationship with my colleagues here, their, their agencies. Uh, some of the things we do, I think, as was mentioned, is we help 
people become citizens. We have an immigration lawyer on our team. We connect clients to therapy, therapists, psychiatrists. We help them find jobs. Housing is not one of the things we do per se, but I, I'm just going to share some of my experiences and observations with housing in terms of working with refugees. And as Ariel mentioned, the people that we serve generally have been here a little bit longer than three months or longer. And often they're people that have kind of fallen through the cracks. Um, not all refugees, you know, many of the refugees that do come here do know how to work a toilet and do know how to use electricity. I don't want you to think that they're all coming from um, places like that, but, but the fact is they're mostly coming with no resources, no funds, no money, because as Ariel mentioned, refugees are people that were violently forced out. They didn't choose to come here, so they really come with the clothes on their back often. I'm just going to go through a few points I made about what I've noticed. One of the things I've noticed, which I think is a good thing, is that I don't really see a lot of anti-refugee discrimination among landlords. Maybe it's out there, but I haven't personally seen that. We do have some landlords that we've dealt with that are difficult, but I think they tend to be difficult with any tenant, not just because our clients are refugees. One interesting thing I noticed, though, is that some of the more difficult landlords are themselves refugees or former refugees or immigrants. And I'm not sure if they just need more education about rights of tenants or what, but that's something that I've noticed, which I found a little bit disturbing, I guess, but interesting. Ariel mentioned the housing codes. We, our, our people tend to have larger families than no, normal American family, and they don't mind living in small apartments. They, they like to be together because it's a comfort, at least at the beginning. But unfortunately, that's not possible based on our, our housing codes. What they're trying to do is recreate a sense of normalcy or a sense of home because, um, you know, it, I have to keep reminding myself that, that the refugees that we see here generally have been living in their home country, their families, for centuries. We're a new country here. We're a mobile society. I lived in, I think I've counted 14 places in my life, which is probably not unusual. It's, I can understand intellectually, but I can't understand in my gut what it's like to have been wrenched out of the village or town that my family was in for centuries and, being, and be plopped in a totally new environment. So they're trying to recreate a sense of home and normalcy as much as they can. The, a lot of... Uh, Extended families will try to get into four or two family flats so they can all share the common space, the backyard. The doors are generally unlocked and open, and so people kind of come and go all day. That can be a problem with safety, which I'll mention in a few minutes. Another thing you may have heard about as far as recreating home, this was sort of a big deal in the news about 10 years ago in St. Louis. We had an influx of a lot of Bosnians coming in. And um, the, uh, some of the Bosnian families in South St. Louis would uh, do two things that neighbors often misunderstood. One of the things was they would, uh, on special occasions or holidays, they would roast a whole lamb on a spit in the backyard. And uh, there were complaints from neighbors thinking that they were roasting dogs or horses or other types of animals. There were, the other thing that they often did, especially when they were able to purchase small homes in the city, was built smoke houses and they look like small sheds but they were used to to smoke meat through the winter time and some of the neighbors were concerned about that being a fire hazard i think we kind of got through that as a city and and i think there's we we reached some understanding i don't know of any fires that were caused by that or anything but that's just that's just i call it a culture bump when when two cultures bump up against each other with without a lot of understanding at first and the other thing that I noticed, I want to point out, is that because you know they've been re re removed from their home country and placed sometimes at random in St. Louis, they don't always, they usually don't have a choice of what city they're going to be re relocated to. They have no roots in, for example, St. Louis or wherever they're resettled, so uh, they are free to relocate themselves if, if and when they are able to financially. And, for example, we have 
the largest Bosnian community in the country, in the world here outside of Bosnia, but I would, I think probably up to a third of them were not resettled here. They relocated here, is that right? About a third of them resettled here from other, country, other cities. I've, I've met Bosnians that moved here from Boston and Phoenix and New York, partly because it was more expensive in those cities and partly because they had family here and, and a developing community. On the other hand, a lot of the Southeast Asian refugees that were relocated here later moved to warmer climates like New Orleans and Texas, a lot of the Cambodians and Laotians. And then a more recent phenomenon is that a lot of the Somalis that have been relocated here moved to Minneapolis, which doesn't make sense to me because it's cold, but that's where the community has developed. Minneapolis is the, first, is the largest Somali community. Columbus, Ohio is the second largest. And I believe we're the third here in St. Louis. But many of our Somalis relocated to Columbus and Minneapolis. I wanted to briefly talk about safety, too. I think um, refugees may have come from countries where there was state-sanctioned violence, political violence directed against their citizens. But for the most part, they were safe with their neighbors. They were safe in their neighborhoods and with their communities. And in, in some ways, it's sort of the opposite of that here. They have to really be reminded to lock their doors when they're living in, in areas around the International Institute and other relatively high crime areas. We've had, you may have heard about, I can think of off the top of my head in the last year, five refugees that were, that were killed in South St. Louis. One recently, an Ethiopian refugee who was working at a, a convenience store and he was shot up, held up and shot. Uh, I had a, there was a family from Burma that was here. The, the husband was a victim of the knockout game and uh, they became so frightened that they just moved out of the city completely. The International Institute does safety training and, and I've, I've worked with the city neighborhood stabilization officers to do training with individual communities. And that's, it, it, as Ariel said, it just takes reminding over and over again. They need to hear it many times before it sinks in. Uh, there are cultural issues that, you know, need to be considered. Sometimes our people may seem to be kind of standoffish when it, in relation to their neighbors, but it's often because they don't speak the language or they're just afraid. They don't, I don't think they mean to come across that way, but it's just a different culture. Many of our families that were resettling now are Muslim, and the, there are some gender-based um, traditions that sometimes are challenging when you're dealing with different cultures. Women don't, wouldn't shake hands with an American man or a, a man that's not a relative. Shoes are not worn in the home, and a lot of these uh, buildings in, in the city, the apartments, are, are, have hardwood floors, so it's, they, they take off their shoes, it's cold on the floor, also, they, many times they'll, they pray five times a day if they're observant Muslims and they pray on the floor. I have a, I have a kind of a funny story about that, if, if I have a minute. I used to work, uh, before I worked at Places for People, I worked at a, at a, at a church-based refugee ministry. And it was, there was me and a Catholic sister there. And um, one day, a woman from Afghanistan came to the church asking for a carpet for her living room floor because it was in the winter time and it was cold and she, you know they they didn't wear their their shoes and and she off she would pray on the floor five times a day so sister paulette said i'm sorry we don't have any carpets so they're walking outside into the parking lot of the church and as they're walking out the door sister paulette said okay let's pray so she said Let's pray to Allah and Buddha and Jesus and anybody who's listening, and let's pray for a carpet. So she started to pray for a carpet. And then with that, literally at that exact moment, from the second floor of the rectory, out of the windows, pieces of carpet came flying out the windows because they were redoing the carpet up there in the <laughs> second floor. So we, this became known as a miracle, a sight of a miracle. So we got a lot more clients coming after that because they thought they'd get what they wanted. Um, but I think my, one of my main messages is that it's really hard to generalize about refugees and immigrants because I think when you get down to it, they're just like us. They want the same things we do. They want, you know, 
they want their kids to have a better life than they do. They want to have a safe place to live. They want, they want happiness, prosperity. And, and for the most part, they're doing that, even in spite of the main, you know, the great odds they've been facing. They, many of them have bought homes. Unfortunately, I've heard about situations where they were, where refugees were exploited by unscrupulous uh, real estate agents. There was one case a couple years ago where a group of people from Burundi were um, approached by somebody who was basically trying to sell them plots of land which turned out to be in that cemetery along Highway 70 by the airport. And many of them lost, it's a long story, but many of them lost money because they, they were too trusting of these bad guys. We do have home, some homeless clients too. Some of our people that come here are disabled because of uh, PTSD, or many of them had been tortured in, con I, I mentioned that we t work with torture survivors. Some of them were tortured in concentration camps, so they have physical as well as psychological problems, which um, made some of them eligible for uh, disability checks. Um, but there's a rule that says you must become a citizen within seven years in order to continue to receive those checks. So some of our people, if they don't, you have to take a test in English to become a citizen, and so some of them were unable to become a citizen, and they, they became homeless because they lost all their benefits or their, their income. So we, we work with people like that, too. Um, I, I don't know, I, maybe I just want to leave you with one thought that, that refugees and immigrants have, I think, I think, have really revitalized St. Louis in many ways. When you look at South Grand and Cherokee and the Bevo area, um, I, I, think, I think it's, we're lucky to have refugees coming here, and I encourage you, if you haven't already, to get to know people from other countries and just listen to their stories, and I, I think you'll have a, a nice reward. So I think I'll turn it over to Julia. Thank you. So my name is Julia Stropolsky. I'm with Bilingual International Assistance Services. I have um, witnessed um, refugee um, life and, and, and the survival and the adjustment uh, firsthand because I was a teenager. And as a teenager, I had my own young experiences, but I also had a chance to see what my grandparents went through as they were learning to adjust to the new country. And um, one of my clients, I think, said it best. Um, where if you replant a young tree, it'll grow and the roots will take, but if you replant an old tree, it'll wither and die. And that's how she felt. That's how many seniors, unfortunately, feel um, when they do have to resettle and face the loss of their homeland. Uh, they may be displaced. Um, they want to be with their adult children, and they come here either for family reunification or because they have no place to go, or even by marriage. Uh, once here, they often find themselves feeling lost, not feeling like they belong. Um, they may be estranged from the family because family roles change. Um, you know, families that were unique and, and, and very large are changing. The grandchildren stop speaking um, um, their native language. When the grandchildren come home from school, grandparents want to know about it, but they're having different frame of reference, and so they feel estranged from their own uh, family members, when they want to give an advice, it's often not an advice the adult children can live by. And it's very isolating for the seniors. And um, the seniors don't want to feel isolated. They don't want to sit at home um, among four walls and think about the past. And usually they've had really, really rough, rough lives. Um, and so they're facing deteriorating health Many of them get a lot um, age faster than, than we're used to seeing here in the uh, United States. In fact, globally, the international, um, uh, international um, scientific world is pushing for the retirement age or the senior, senior age to be 55, whereas here we see it growing to 68 and 70. What they often fear are unsafe neighborhoods. They want to feel okay about coming outside, going to the neighboring store. They want to be able to navigate through the neighborhood. They want to be able to support themselves. 
Um, they're afraid of going to a nursing home, and very often we rely on landlords and neighbors and neighborhood associations to make a referral to, uh, for instance, our agency that comes out and helps individuals through case management and home care and personal care and setting up um, assistance and mental health services interpretation so that they can live independently as much as possible. Um, they're afraid of falling at home. They're afraid of uh, losing whatever independence uh, they have. And if you can imagine yourself, you know, uh, Ariel uh, talked about moving to Saudi Arabia. Imagine you did move to Saudi Arabia and imagine you were at home alone and you fell and you could not speak Arabic and nobody else could speak um, English. And, and, and we, we have faced situations where seniors were literally on the floor for hours and some of them um, a day. Um, and, and, and more because nobody had come to check on them. For some reason, and we're, we're such funny creatures, we assume that the communities take care of their own. And I think it does take a village. And I think assuming that that person, because they don't speak the language, are doing fine and somebody who does speak the language will take care of them is a wrong assumption. So I will say this, um, the seniors we have met will give their last penny to pay their landlord they will not fall behind on their rent. But they will also not pay for their medication or not pay for their food or not attend to their needs very often because they just don't have the money. And so the social services that we offer will assist them in becoming citizens and becoming um, recipients of uh, food stamps or arranging meals and wills or what have you so that they can you know, live in the community and enjoy that living. Um, they're afraid of getting deported. Many, many times the seniors are, um, I had one situation where a senior was so sure he was gonna get deported every time there was an envelope with the state emblem on it. And that's because of the history of fear, being fearful of the government. And what are the landlords? What are the social workers? They are seen as extension of the government. So we work very diligently in helping people overcome that and building the rapport so that they know that we can be trusted and we can bring good things to their lives. Um, you know, just some tips to remember is to check on them. Uh, if you've rented out to a senior, know that they also may not be telling you about their needs. We've had situations where they didn't know that they can call the landlord and request that the air conditioner unit be fixed. Uh, we've had situations where people could no longer um, get out because of the stairs, but they didn't know that they could get a ramp. We've had various situations where individuals were not informed about their rights and also what resources are there in the community. Um, so uh, please remember to check on them. Um, please remember that we rely on people who, um, who are in close proximity to identify individuals in need. And there are many, many supports that are available. Uh, Money Follows the Person is a Missouri State program um, that is being very successful. Um, people may, need benef uh, may benefit from ramps and bars and stools so that they could live independently. Um, we, we see the seniors really want to live as a part of the community. And when we watch them become United States citizens, and when they, especially when they've done it on their own and they learned the very tedious task, and they come out with this big grin and they say, now I want to vote, and they say, now I'm an American. It's just an amazing feeling to know that we've been able to help somebody become an American, help somebody feel like they're a part of this larger, wonderful community. So, no, we're not a melting pot, we're a salad. Potato is a potato, tomato is a tomato. You know, uh, we're cucumbers and lettuces, and together we bring out the best taste. So, um, thank you. All right, very interesting. We are a little behind schedule, so if there are questions, we can just take maybe two if you want to head up to the microphone. But we do owe you a 10-minute break here after questions, and we'll talk more at length about uh, elderly and disabled communities after that, and then, of course, get to the final segment of the afternoon. Do we have any specific questions? We've got 
One right here from a former panelist. Yes, I just have a quick question, um, and I guess this touches all three of you, about it seems like there's always kind of a fluidity to the landscape that you're working in. Um, you know, you, in five years, you'll probably be doing something a little different. I don't know if you could speak quickly to the direction you think your agencies are going. Um, I know the International Institute's moving into a much bigger facility in a slightly different neighborhood. I don't know the other two, if you could speak to that, please. How do you see your agencies changing in the next, say, five or ten years? One of the things that my team in Places for People is going to be focusing on, at least this year, is, is the problem of substance abuse among refugees, because we're seeing that as a growing problem. So we're going to focus on that for one thing. Um, last year, our team had become navigators under the Affordable Care Act. And we had seen just tremendous number of individuals come through. Uh, we had superseded all of our expectations with the grantors who uh, funded us under the Affordable Care Act because many folks still relied on same language speakers to provide that assistance and that important counseling, navigation, and enrollment to them. Uh, we also just now received funding from the County Children's Fund to expand into working with the kids. And um, last year, we were the first in the state of Missouri to open Multicultural um, Senior Center. And we are just very blessed to see every day different uh, groups of people come and be able to socialize, learn about the United States, you know, um, learn about US history and civics, learn about disease, learn about housing and management in their own language. And that's an amazing, amazing uh, growth. Um, we'd like to see ourselves bigger and better, and we're already listed among the promising practices of uh, um, uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and I'm hoping that within five years we will have an evidence-based practice that we would be able to bring to you all. One of the things that the International Institute is developing right now, and it's still in, in progress, is collaborations with employers and universities, especially for our clients who arrive with degrees, so that teachers and engineers and dentists and, and doctors and nurses can even go back into that field. They might have to go back to school, maybe for a, quote, refresher course, and then get licensed, but we're working with the, the, the collaborators in the education world and the employment world so that we can provide that training, if you will, for, for those professionals so that when they do arrive, they're not, you know, pushing a broom, um, um, you know, for the next three years. Maybe they're pushing a broom and going to classes to get licensed. All right. Ariel Burgess, International Institute, Julia Ostropolsky with Bilingual International Assistance Services, and Ron Clutho, Places for People. Thank you, all three of you, for joining us this afternoon. I had one question. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see you back there. One last question. Okay. Uh, the mine final is a word. question to all three. I came here as a student from South Africa. My husband came here as a refugee from Namibia. And in my past experiences, I've managed a refugee camp. So I assure you we come in all shapes, forms, and sizes and experiences. And it is a question of teaching people to adjust and acclimatize to where they are. My question to you, in, especially in the context of the post-Ferguson St. Louis, is what are you doing to create awareness and better understanding among refugees in particular to feel comfortable in all communities? Because my sense is there's an actual hierarchy among refugees and immigrants in this city based on skin color. These are more hardworking, these are less hardworking, therefore they succeed. But the critical question is, when you have a youth from Africa, if I look, I'm not sure if that's an African-American youth or an African youth, and it should not matter. We're all equal. So in this context, how are you working to help refugees understand that wherever they are, we follow the rules, we don't fear people, we accept each other? Because I see, especially in the housing context, that refugees are being herded into South St. Louis on the basis that North St. Louis is extremely dangerous. But I heard Ron say five refugees were killed in recent times in South St. Louis. I think it's extremely important in the messages we heard today about diverse, integrated 
societies to also include refugees in those initiatives. So I'd be interested to know what you're thinking around there. Thank you. Um, I think I understand the question. You know, I like to think that typically when a client comes to see me, they're first of all seeing a woman, which sometimes in their culture might be different for them. Um, they're speaking and interacting with a woman, but typically they also will mistakenly think that I'm your middle class white bread um, Caucasian um, who's somewhat educated. And I will tell you that both of my parents are Mexican, and I went to the school for the deaf elsewhere. Um, so I did not, I, I don't prescribe to, to this you know, look. And once clients begin to talk and we begin to know each other, those barriers break down. There is a hierarchy, yes, um, even among refugees. Um, it's sad, but when refugee children go to school, whoever the newest population is, they're like, oh good, that just got me higher up on the rung, so now I can um, um, pick on, on these other individuals. It's constantly getting to know people and treating them as humans. It doesn't matter if I'm hearing impaired or if my parents are Mexican. Um, I'm a human first. Um, and that's how I think that, that I, at least, like to, to try to interact with our clients. I have um, several points. And one, uh, to, uh, to resettlement process. When we um, came as refugees, and, and this has been already proven, within the first four months, within the first at most funding the received by resettlement agencies to train and educate, we're in the days. We can't learn, we can't process. There is so much to learn. There is so much to take in. There is so much, okay, go here but not here. You know, do this but not that. Um, everything is different and, and the person is in the state of shock. I think, um, I think Bilingual International would not exist and would not need to exist if the providers citywide, statewide, nationwide realized that they should make their services accessible to everybody. If the powers would be when they wanted to budget for the next year and they budgeted for a janitor, also budgeted for interpreters. If the agencies did not pretend like the foreign born did not live in their areas because they never come to their door. Well, you know what? They don't come to the door because they don't know what you do and that you're there. And that when you even publicize in Spanish and they happen to speak Kurdish, that you will even have somebody pick up the phone and be able to understand what they're saying. So I think it's a question to the whole community at large. I think it takes all of us to help refugees feel adjusted. I think it takes all of us to help refugees um, feel at home. And I think it takes all of us to realize that whatever brought us here, um, you know, my children are American born, so when they speak, you will not hear their accent. But whatever brought us here, none of us are native. To United States, so you know, just 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 opening our arms to people from outside of where we're used to, whether it's our community or the street we're comfortable with living, and inviting people from other worlds and other universes is the way to go. I think that education should not stop. I think it should not stop with educating the refugees. I think it should not stop with educating the kids, because um, I see a lot of. Um, a lot of stereotypes start, you know, and stereotypes, I say racism, discrimination, all of those horrible isms, they begin with our kids at schools, with American kids speaking on the refugee kids or your mom dresses funny or whatever. You know, so we should all take part in that. And that's, sorry. Sorry for talking too long. <laughs> um, we basically focus on specific goals, like getting a job or getting citizenship for a, a, a kind of a relatively brief amount of time. So I don't, I don't think we really, you know, overtly discuss things like this, but I think, I hope, I hope, I like to think that we show by our actions and by the diversity of, of 
my agency that that you know we we do treat people as individuals we we I would like to think we don't discriminate among amongst refugees and between refugees and native born people um, as I, th I think as Julia said when you're when refugees or, or immigrants are new here, it's, it's just you're in a daze because there's, it's the over, information overload. And I think it takes time to sort all these issues out. But um, I, I think your point is well taken and it just, it just it's, it's an ongoing process for all of us, I'd say. All right, thank you.